a fallacy of our times, our times being 1850 here, but I don't think much has changed. It is not considered sufficient that the law should be just, it must be philanthropic. Nor is it sufficient that the law should guarantee to every citizen the free and inoffensive use of his faculties for physical, intellectual and moral self-improvement. Instead, it is demanded that the law should directly extend welfare, education and morality throughout the nation. And so he's appealing here to the fact that the law, meaning the coercive apparatus in his society, is doing more than simply asking people to be just by imposing a framework of non-coercion. It is actually imposing a framework of coercion to try to achieve these other social goals. So if that's what freedom is then, if that's what libertarians conceive of when they say they're pro-freedom, what does freedom do? What is good about freedom? How does that non-coercive framework make things better? Well, libertarians also want to fix social problems and make and achieve desirable social goals, as do, do other people. And we have various ways that we can see of being able to do that within a non-coercive framework. We try to instill virtuous behaviour in the market through the fact that people tend, in a system with no subsidies or prohibitions, to incur the natural consequences of their own actions. If a person wishes to take recreational drugs, for example, the free market does not prohibit that, doesn't prevent them doing it, nor does it subsidise that behaviour by giving them, say, public hospitals or methadone clinics to assist them, or by subsidising their insurance against bad things happening to them, or by reducing sentences for criminal activities when they say, well, I'm a drug addict, you're on. Okay. Libertarians don't conceive of that as something that they should either subsidise or prohibit. And therefore, a person who engages in that kind of behaviour will tend to reap whatever are the natural consequences of that behaviour. If those consequences are good, fine. If those consequences are bad, that's unfortunate. And this, we believe, will tend to instil in people moral virtues, insofar as they will tend to start adopting behaviours that work well, that achieve good outcomes, and that is really the essence of what virtuous conduct is. To avoid short-range uh, behaviour which is destructive in the long run, for an immediate gain, and to be more far-sighted. Libertarians also believe that Within the framework of the free market, this is a very powerful engine for allowing the production of resources and free trade of resources to make sure that wealth will tend to increase very rapidly. And I think historically that's been shown to be the case. And so, if anything, I think libertarians have a very, very strong claim to saying that our system is one that very much frees people from want, has been proven over and over again historically and also through economic theory, to be very productive and be, a, be able to achieve that goal of freeing people from hunger, disease, poverty and so on. Finally, libertarians, while many of us are maybe anti-communist or this or that, we do conceive that we will allow voluntary communities within that property rights framework. If a person wants to form a commune or a group of people a person forming a commune is a little bit silly. If a, rather, if a group of people want to form a commune, and if they want to buy up some property and do that, then certainly libertarians and classical liberals will say, hey, it's your property. If you want to jointly own it and run it that way, good luck to you. I don't particularly think that's a good way of living, but we'll allow those kinds of experiments to occur in the market. If you're right that communism works very well, you would tend to prosper. If you're wrong, which I think you are, you will tend to not do very well. And so for all these reasons, libertarians give people a great deal of freedom, not just freedom of coercion, freedom from coercion rather, its central tenet, but also freedom from want through the generation of wealth, and freedom from offence and sadness and so on, through the fact that we believe that this is the best mechanism to instill moral virtue and good con conduct in people. I want to talk a little bit more about virtuous behaviour because I think this is a, a key point of libertarianism that is often ignored. This is not just an economic theory which says we'll all just get rich. Uh, that's one part of it. But a free market based on property rights encourages virtue in a, in a lot of ways. In an overarching sense, the market encourages something called long-range time preference. 
which is an economic uh, kind of description of a term that says that people will tend to become long-range thinkers. They'll tend to become more inclined to defer immediate gratification for longer-range value. And there's various reasons for this. One is that in a, in a society with rising wealth, when people start to live longer and suffer less from morbidity, the fact that they're living longer will lead them to plan further in advance for their future, knowing that they'll need things further down the track. Having a wealthier country also creates a greater incentive for long-range time preference, insofar as if you're already wealthy, your marginal value of immediate extra things right now is generally slightly less, and therefore you can afford to defer quite a bit of your resources off to the future. Now, long-range time preference is one of those ideas within economic theory that manifests itself in a whole lot of behaviours. A whole lot of degenerative or vice-like behaviours are things where we gain, uh, in the short term, at the expense of the long term. Someone who is, for example, a drug addict is not irrational in one sense. They are trading immediate euphoria for long-range degeneration and health problems. And long-range time preference <coughs> tends to militate against that. Short-range time preference tends to enforce it. So one of the things I suppose that a lot of libertarian theorists have argued is that moral virtue in a hundred different ways will manifest itself through a general extension of people's time preference. Moreover, the market mechanism of trade encourages specific virtues, such as honesty and integrity. When people have to trade repeatedly with others, they require that they build up a reputation for honest dealing, and they require that, if anything, they don't um, build up a reputation as someone that welches on a deal or, um, or cheats or lies or anything like that. That's much more important in a market-based framework where you don't have any specific right to a good or service, you only have the right to trade. And finally, as I've said, the absence of subsidization and prohibition of conduct tends to mean that people will get the natural consequences of their actions, um, and this encourages rationality, productivity, and thrift, <coughs> and indeed many moral virtues. The production of resources is, is something that I think people are very familiar with, you even really don't hear socialists arguing that it's more productive than capitalism anymore. Uh, I think this is an argument that's really won. The free market is now widely understood to be highly conducive to good productivity and the increase in wealth. And this, uh, this comes about for many reasons. The absence of government intervention allows price signals and rational economic calculation. This was uh, something that uh, Mises and Hayek famously uh, argued and, and have spoken about the way that the price system operates as an information bearing mechanism to allow people to allocate resources efficiently. That means that less resources are wasted. The absence of government regulation and tax reduces dead weight loss of resources. Generally when the government intervenes in a market to tax something or to impose a regulation, uh, it's not a zero sum game. They don't gain the same amount of tax revenue as is lost in the economy in the market. There's what we call a dead weight loss meaning the amount of revenue raised by that intervention is less than the loss um, that occurred in the market. And finally, security and respect for private property rights incentivizes production and saving. And this is obviously a, a huge difference between wealthy Western countries and very poor countries. One of the big problems and the big barriers to their increase in wealth is that people don't feel secure in their property rights in many countries, and therefore there is not so much incentive to invest and produce and save. And finally, with voluntary communities, I touched on this a little before, but I'd like to say a bit more in general about it. Within libertarian theory, we do recognise the possibility that people might form together um, on their own property, in groups, and wish to experiment with a different kind of uh, internal governance of their group. They might wish to create a commune, for example or they might wish to create uh, any other kind of um, society, perhaps a society which practices a particular religious code. Uh, a group of Muslims might to get together, buy out an area of property and say that they'd like everyone living there to practice Sharia law. So a group of Christians might uh, 
like people to abide by the Christian code of morality, and so on. Other groups might uh, be interested in having an entirely hedonistic society. Uh, and there's a lot of scope for this within a private property framework. So groups seeking particular lifestyles can band together and make common rules and practices within this framework. People seeking to avoid particular behaviours can do this within a private property framework by ex excluding others who have behaviours that they don't like and by trying to form together with people of like mind. And there's no issues of rules over public property favouring particular groups. So there's a lot of reason to expect that far from creating conflict, a libertarian society would actually allow a lot of social controversies and a lot of social conflict to peaceably resolve simply by the parties separating into their own respective areas, living according to their lifestyles, visiting if they want, so long as they're respecting the property rights of others. And therefore, a lot of the kinds of uh, social controversies <laughs> Uh, that you get in a status society uh, really dissipate. I just wanted to put up a couple of graphs just to uh, back up this point that a free market um, society creates a lot of wealth. Um, this is uh, some data from a, uh, a study of uh, freedom of various different countries versus their economic growth. You can see in the chart on the left that the GDP per capita in most free countries is much more than in the least free. And this isn't simply a historical um, outcome of the fact that they have grown wealthy. It's also a continuing process that those countries that are most free are also growing at a higher rate, which is what we can see in the chart on the right. Contrary to the assertions of many people who say that a free market will create rising inequality and rising misery for the poor, um, Actual data shows that to be completely nonsense. Uh, the most free countries, the annual income of the poorest 10% of people is really an orders of magnitude above the poorest 10% of people in the least free countries. And indeed, even the growth rate in income for that poorest group of people is higher than in the less free countries. So it's simply also not the case that this is something that only benefits the wealthy. Uh, it tends to benefit uh, people on the bottom rung of the social ladder a great deal. Um, so the results of freedom. The results of freedom we've seen are increasing freedom and wealth, freedom that is in a, a non-coercive sense, increasing health, well-being, education and so on, through the fact that more resources are available for these things, increasing moral virtue and cooperation if we believe that those things are conducive to good interaction in the market, a wider range of services and opportunities, and a greater diversity of choice in services and lifestyles. And I'll just end with this quote from Milton Friedman and Rose Friedman, since this is the Friedman Conference. He says, a society that puts equality in the sense of equality of outcome ahead of freedom will end up with neither, neither equality nor freedom. On the other hand, a society that puts freedom first will, as a happy byproduct, end up with both greater freedom and greater equality. And I would probably add to that, greater freedom from want and offensive behaviour and degenerate behaviours and all of those other things that we saw that we would like to be free from as well. So that's all I really had to say today. Thank you very much for listening. Maybe the microphone and then you threw it straight away. All right. I'm uh, we're almost out of time, uh, but if you don't mind uh, going to the morning tea, we can take a couple of questions. If there is uh, a burning desire. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that presentation. Um, it seems that a lot of your analysis on freedom was contingent on the fundamental value of property rights. Would you like? Sorry. Would you like going into a little bit more of the objective moral philosophy behind why we should like why where do property rights come from more than just being like utilitarian means to all the great outcomes to establish mm. freedom? What the inherent value? Sure. Well, I mean, I guess there's lots of different arguments in favour of that structure. Um, I'll just mention four. Um, the utilitarian <laughs> argument... Sorry. Only four. Um, the utilitarian consequentialist type argument that this leads to good consequences is obviously one. Um, there's a, an argument put forward by Ayn Rand, who argues that essentially, um, from a kind of moral point of view, uh, a person that man's mind is his means of survival, 
And if man's mind is his means of survival, just as for a tiger, his means of survival are his sharp teeth and claws, then we ought not do things which undermine that means of survival. And, and Rand argues that to live in a coercive fashion, to coerce others rather than dealing with them in a voluntary fashion, is to destroy that means of survival of the mind, and therefore to inherently destroy um, the capacity of man to, um, to survive and prosper. Um, Another argument comes from Rothbard, who essentially lays out, I guess, a framework of what he thinks the alternatives are for how property could arise initially. And he, uh, I won't go through it in detail, but he essentially says, okay, if, if people don't acquire property initially from mixing labour with land, how could we conceive of them of acquiring property? And really the only other alternative is the way that the state does it, simply through declaration. I own the moon now because I say so. Uh, and so Rothbard goes through these competing um, ideas of how property rights could come about and tries to argue that these contrary notions are a reductio ad absurdum. <coughs> the fourth example is a guy called Hans Hopp who argues that in a, in a sense whenever we speak to people at all and try and make a case for whatever, he calls this argumentation, if, I, if I'm a socialist say and try to argue with you that to the contrary private property is not a good idea, Popper says that I'm engaged in a performative contradiction because by the very fact of arguing with you, I'm acknowledging that we ought to be dealing with each other mind to mind, voluntarily, by my convincing you instead of just beating you over the head. Uh, so he says implicit in the very act of argumentation, even if you're a socialist or a fascist or whatever, is your recognition that, hey, you're not just beating this guy over the head right now. You obviously believe in some sense of, of his property right in his own body. So that's four examples. There are more. I'm happy to go into them maybe in the break, but I think I've probably just bore everyone. Yes? How do we deal with the possibility of an organisation, for instance, the Sharia Commune, you just described, yes. exploding out of all sorts of adverse and consequences, or the drug addict who drug drives, and you've got the, the, the consequence of the negligence hitting other people with it? I suppose to start with, I don't think you get too much problem with drug addicts exploding out of Sharia law, right? <laughs> but um, but uh, I take it from your point that you're talking about two separate examples there. I'm just kidding. Um, I, I think, well, if, you know, you have to be careful when you talk about these things, the idea that it might explode out and harm other people, because that's a bit vague. What do we mean when we talk about exploding out? In order for, the, for some group to expand, it must do so in one of two ways either by conquest and coercion, which we've already said is not allowed, or by voluntarily encouraging people that this is a good way to live. So I think um, the non-coercion rule already takes care of that. On your second point about, well, what happens if, say, a drug addict's negligence or something else harms another? Well, that's where we come back to this idea of justice and rectification, that we recognise that there are torts and negligence and so on, and if you harm another person, even accidentally, or uh, invade their property and damage their property, even accidentally, you're required to give compensation for that. So I, I, I do think there's, there's a framework for that within property rights. I'm sorry, we can't okay. do any more questions. Sorry, you're very, you're free to ask me questions in break. You'll be around for the full time again, won't you? Uh, for today at least and some tomorrow. So yeah, please attack him across him and ask him questions. <laughs>